Rhiannon. Thank you, Mr. President. The Greens do not support the National Water Commission Abolition Bill. The National Water Commission is the most important organisation that we really do need to retain. It provides crucial oversight of our water policies. And it's worth remembering how they're operating, with a very small team doing important work. I understand that that team recently went from about 41 to 8. Now, the Commission has provided governments and industry with quality information needed to make good decisions about the effectiveness of our current water policies and directions for the future. What is being lost here is the integrated approach. The integrated approach is so important when it comes to water. And that's what the Commission has provided for water policy in the 10 years of its existence, and we really can't afford to lose it. It is of grave concern to me that, given the current threats to our water supplies from climate change, the mining industry in particular, but also the ongoing struggles between water use for production and water use for the environment, we are looking at removing the only body that brings together oversight of our water policy. Now, it is true that there are other prop, um, bodies that provide important information in this area. The government's independent expert scientific committee on coal seam gas and large coal mining, for instance. But it's the National Water Commission that is in um, place where these groups actually come together to sort through these issues. The processes of the National Water Initiative and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan have been well shepherded by the Commission. This work is still tenuous and needs ongoing support. Removing the National Water Commission sends the wrong message to those involved in these processes. Now, it's of great concern to me, as the National Water Commission itself has pointed out, that the proposed reporting date for the first audit of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan has been moved to 2018 in this legislation. We've already had delays in the readiness of this plan, which is why the Commission was only able to offer an interim report in 2013. Now, this is one of the crucial aspects of this legislation that underlines why this bill should not pass. We need oversight of the Murray-Darling Basin process from an independent body. That's what we have right now, and that's what we could lose. As many of the stakeholders in this debate have noted, the government can't be marking its own homework. That was a message that we heard time and again at the inquiry that was held into this legislation. Yet, under the government's plans, the marking doesn't even occur. The plan will be implemented before we are able to intervene. Now, this is very a very concerning aspect of this legislation. This legislation proposes to move the National Water Commission's reporting requirements on the National Water Initiative and the Murray-Darling ba Basin Plan over to the Productivity Commission. Now, this is just not satisfactory. It will really de um, degrade this work. It's a concern to the Greens and should be a concern to all who care about the future of our water planning. Now, you'll hear many people here say that, but if they are sincere, they will keep the National Water Commission. As a number of submissions to the inquiry on this legislation have pointed out, the Commission does not yet have the expertise needed to advise on these matters. The Productivity Commission's expertise is in economic matters, not those of the environment. And that is set out when you look at the objects of how the Productivity Commission works. It is very clear. It is quite narrow. We're not disputing that, but it doesn't have the expertise, the background, to take on the important work of the NWC. The Productivity Commission was never established with the management of environmental matters in mind. It came in 1998 out of the combination of the Industry Commission. Bureau of Industry, Economics and Economic Planning Advisory Commission. Its legislation reflects these priorities very clearly. Section 6, Functions of the Commission, sets this, sets this out. It uses the term industry, industry development and productivity. It uses those terms five times. Nowhere is the environment mentioned, not once. Protecting the environment is not a function of the Productivity Commission. Now, if we continue to section 8, the policy guidelines for the Productivity Commission, these two are about economic performance, reducing regulation, 
encouraging growth, economic adjustments and other issues to do with the economy and industry. It is not until we get down to dot point I in this section that we see the term ecological sustainable. And this still is only in the context of industry development. It, it is just not set out in terms of an envir environmental judgment, environment being a key uh, consideration of how this body undertakes its work. The Productivity Commission has multiple competing priorities in its reporting requirements. It is not able to sufficiently capture, and nor does this legislation allow it to, the breadth of work carried out by the National Water Commission. So that's a key point. I know that the government has been lobbying hard to get support for say, um, taking the work of the National Water Commission over to the Productivity Commission and making out that the work of the, how the Productivity Commission operates can cover the important endeavours and work undertaken by the NWC. But right now, and how the um, Producti Productivity Commission is actually structured, that is not possible. The ongoing functions of the National Water Commission, in particular of stakeholder engagement on all water-related issues, are nowhere to be found in this legislation. Imagine that. Stakeholder engagement not found in this legislation, a key part of how the National Water Commission has operated, and that is what we will lose if this bill goes through. Some minimal functions go to the Department of Environment and others, but there is no central coordination of all these issues. Another very worrying aspect. We need that central coordination, and that is what we could lose. This, I suggest, is precisely what the government wants. There is um, an agenda here pushed by the government, uh, and this is part of it. The government's approach really is quite fragmented. It removes the thorough leadership and the continuity offered by the Commission. The government's plan to, to remove the National Water Commission is not leadership. It is not even management. Um, it is not even the management we need when it comes to water policy across this country. Sustaining our water supply and protecting the environment to facilitate this should be our top priority, and that is what we could lose if this bill goes through. Hearings at the inquiry into this legislation have made abundantly clear the contrary to government claims that the National Water Commission A country, sorry, um, hearings of the inquiry into this legislation have made abundantly clear the contrary to government claims that the National Water Commission has done its job and that water is well covered by other government bodies. Water reform at the state level is at risk of unravelling if we lose the National Water Commission. Now, in my state, New South Wales, we have seen the consolidation of water bodies at the same time as water licences are, according to the Australian Conservation Foundation, being handed out to farmers who have illegally diverted water. And this is what we mean about unravelling. We have um, not only a lack of integration, but um, some very um, dubious practices being allowed to play out that actually threaten our water resources. Following the abolition of Queensland's water commissioner, that state is keeping up its reputation for really tearing, about, um, tearing apart anything to do with the environment by amending its Water Act to automatically grant licences to mine and, and coal seam gas operation, operations. And again, to emphasise, to automatically grant licences to mine coal seam gas operations. I mean, that is a, can be a direct threat to our water resources under no circumstances should it be allowed to happen automatically. The picture is no better elsewhere. In Victoria, water protections are being weakened, and in Western Australia and the Northern Territory, they are not compliant with the National Water Initiative. The National Water Commission itself has argued that water has fallen off the COAG agenda. Now, this is actually not a surprise, since it seems that the current policy of coalition governments at state and federal levels is a return to the laissez-faire days where we allow irresponsible use of water resources until there is another emergency 
They might get away with that. Governments may get away with this. Let it let anything let it, anything happen with regard to the use of water resources and not have the plans and the limits in place. But there will be another drought. There will be another extreme weather event associated with climate change. There will be an another weather emergency that we need to respond to. And that is why we need to retain the National Water Commission so we are well placed for that response. We are ready for it and we have taken measures to limit the impact of those very damaging um, extreme weather events. Two, cru two crucial areas of water policy that were highlighted by the inquiry into this legislation but are not covered at all by this legislation demonstrate the need for real leadership on water policy. Because when you get rid of the National Water Commission, basically you're getting rid of leadership in this area. This is the gap that will be left by the Commission. The Commission's job to identify areas in need of reform and begin those discussions. Now, one of those areas is Indigenous water rights. Working on Indigenous water rights with the First Peoples Water Engagement Council, the Commission has earned itself a most important and well-earned reputation for its consultative approach to these issues. This process involved extensive engagement, culminating in a First Peoples National Water Summit, which gave advice to the Commission in May 2012. Now, that's actually outstanding. I'd say it was historic and, again, underlines how much we stand to lose if this bill goes through. The initiative has already been wound back to the Indigenous Water Advisory Committee formed by the Environment Department, but this too was wound up in June this year. And this is a pattern we're seeing with this government, because this legislation hasn't gone through yet, but there's been so many steps that this government has taken, so many actions, to actually gut this National Water Commission before the legislation gets here. I think it's actually a very immoral and undemocratic way that they operate. The story of these, um, the story of these organisations is a sad indictment on the way governments to, too often operate in their interactions with Indigenous people. For the first time, the Aboriginal community had been engaged on these issues. That's what had been achieved with those important meetings uh, um, and round tables of these organisations. There had been talk of even adding an Indigenous commissioner to the National Water Commission. How impressive is that? I mean, that progress was being made here. But what we've seen is a government that makes out it has a commitment to Indigenous issues. Will even make out it's got a commitment to decent water policies. But there, in that 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 quite simple but very um, negative, damaging act, uh, the government has set back the rights of Indigenous people with regard to water in this country. The closure of the National Water Commission will be the final step in undoing these important processes. We've also seen initiatives from the Commission in highlighting the potential impact of coal seam gas on our water supplies. Across the nation, I'm sure many of us have witnessed in the last three or four years in particular, there have been an explosion of local communities coming together, taking on coal seam gas and mining projects. Often they're farmers whose livelihood depends on the safety and health of their water. Whenever I visit these communities, this is the issue that is raised. How do we protect our water? How do we protect our water now and into the future? The National Water Commission raised this issue in 2010 and has continued to voice concerns that this is an area which needs more work. Just staying in New South Wales and looking to our northwest, there is an ongoing drought there. And this is a real reminder that what happens in this country, there will be another drought. There'll be a ma um, massive droughts. There'll be droughts um, located in certain areas. We need to be prepared. We have much more knowledge these days, but we need the National Water Commission to provide that integrated leadership. We may have recovered from the millennium drought and we may have negotiated, and I emphasise negotiated, a plan to recover the Murray-Darling, but the work of water reform is far from over. The negotiations aren't really finished, despite what we're hearing from the minister. I would have hoped that we'd learn from this process. It is very, very expensive to retrospectively fix a problem with water. Sometimes it's not possible. And I would point out to Minister Barnaby Joyce, who seems to think that if we just build massive dams everywhere, we'll be fine. 
You have to have the water to start with. Dams don't create water, as the minister seems to allude to in some of his ridiculous statements. And not only do we need to preserve our water, we need to ensure we do it in a way that is clean. We also, um, you also need to make sure you won't be diverting water from places where it is desperately needed. And that's another great failing of Minister Joyce's approach to water conservation in this country. It is not only a grave mistake to destroy our only body, the National Water Commission, that is independent and has the relevant expertise to, to, to guide our governments on water policy. It's really utterly irresponsible. As was pointed out to the committee investigating this legislation, keeping the National Water Commission would push the government's budget out by one ten thousandth of a per cent. This isn't a budget measure in this case. We often can identify what is a budget measure, and obviously the higher education bill this week has been a standout. But with this bill, it's not a budget measure. You really feel it's ideologically driven. It's ideologically driven because the government wants to strip down the quite simple, not extensive leadership um, can, and, um, and in, at times control that the National Water Commission can exercise in this area because they want to be able to favour uh, their big constituents, those who need big water operations for their activities in rural Australia. Now, that, that again is very short term thinking, even short term thinking for those who will ben benefit in the short run because right now we need to be doing everything to bring in our water policy to a point where it's responsible not just for certain users but for the whole nation, not just for this generation but for future generations, not just for those of us in the city but those of us across the whole country, and environmental protection needs to be a critical part of that. Now, as was pointed out to the committee investigating this legislation, keeping the National Water Commission would push the government's budget, as I said, out by just a fraction. Now, that is a bargain. I would urge my colleagues in the Senate to go vote against abolishing the National Water Commission and, and support the reinstatement of funding that is about to go to the Productivity Commission if this bill was passed. The National Water Commission still has a leadership in place. All its fine work is still there. The need to um, address issues across the nation, integration between the states, take forward the National Water Initiative is work that remains to be done. This bill should not pass. Thank you, Mr. Deputy, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator.